Hey, everybody. Um, so exciting to be here. Thanks, Richard, for the very kind introduction. So I am going to share my first Elm app with all of you, which I'm, I'm like a little bit surprised that I got this talk accepted, being more of a beginner with Elm. But I guess my takeaway um, that I like to share with everybody before I start is if you don't feel like you're an expert or you don't know what you would talk about if you were to give a talk, um, I'm here to say do it anyway, because you definitely have something to share with the community, even if you're a beginner like me. So that's my pitch. Reach out to me later if you want to talk about public speaking. Um, so yes, as Richard said, I work at Sentry. I'm a developer advocate. This is my first tech job, yay. <laughs> and aside from that, I mean, come ask me about Sentry later. We're an open source error reporting tool, and I will be happy to talk all about it. Um, since that's my job. But aside from that, on the weekends, I'm an aspiring musician also. I started when I was a kid with piano. And the only way that I learned how to do music was by slowly memorizing a song and, and learning the muscle memory part. But I never learned music theory. And I never learned how to read music either. So this was my workaround. I would pencil in all the notes and very, very slowly figure out where they are on the keyboard one by one, and then memorize it over several months <laughs> or years. Uh, and it turns out this is not the best way to do it. I mean, I got pretty far this way, but it wasn't ideal. I think of it a lot like programming. Like, you could build a really complex application without knowing how to touch type, but the experience is not ideal, right? So this is how I do music, basically. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a hunt and peck musician. And I want to get better at it. Mm. So this is my inspiration for this project. This is the game that taught me how to touch type when I was a kid. And I played this at school. And all of my, all of my classmates were really obsessed with this game because, well, as you can see here, it looks like a game, even though it's actually just a typing, typing test dressed up as a game. <laughs> we, we loved it because. It, it basically tricked us into thinking that we were having fun typing, when <laughs> typing's not that fun. <laughs> but I, uh, this makes me really, really nostalgic. And I thought, well, why don't I just copy this technique and make a game, quote unquote, um, like Mario teaches sheet music. And it turns out this is not an original idea to combine the idea of piano and typing. Um, this is an early printing telegraph from the early 1900s. And check out the UI here. Basically, people would type messages to each other on what looks like a piano. <laughs> so I wanted to take this idea and run with it. And I found a few different technologies along the way that made the project even more exciting. So a lot of things that I was trying for the first time, including, of course, Elm, which is why I'm here. And to me, Elm, if it was a person, <laughs> Elm would be Bob Ross. Uh, because it was literally named after a happy little tree. And, <laughs> and it's, it's you know, a really friendly language, so it makes me think of him and just being like, super chill and calm and like, encouraging. And the compiler really is the friendliest compiler I've ever met. And so I, I figured, OK, well, like, maybe this is interesting. Um, the part that really convinced me was learning that McMaster University uses Elm to teach kids how to code as their very first language, actually. They can't imagine doing that with other functional languages, like say Haskell, like 10-year-olds learn Haskell as their first language. <laughs> like, no, that would not happen. So I figured if a bunch of 10-year-olds can learn Elm as their first language, like, oh, maybe functional programming isn't that scary after all, and I can probably learn it too. So I started while I was at the Recurse Center. Quick shout out also to Dan Abrams and Noah Gordon, who I know they're not here today, but they were there with me, and they helped encourage me to get over my fears of functional stuff and, and get started. And so I made this project with a bunch of friends. And it was, it was a really buggy app that didn't really do anything. But we had a lot of fun and shared it online. And then Evan himself replied to me, <laughs> which was super fun. And, and this just reminded me, you know, the, there's downsides of picking a, a very new language because the tooling maybe isn't quite there yet. And you know, there's not as many libraries yet. But the upside is it's a really tight-knit community. And everyone I've met so far has been super friendly. And sometimes the creator of the language will come say hi to you on Twitter. And now I can bug Evan to like fix all my bugs for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Where, where are you? <laughs> OK, anyway. <laughs> so the next technology I'll talk about briefly is the musical instrument digital interface, also known as MIDI. And this was standardized in the 1980s. 
as a way to get synthesizers and other digital instruments to talk to each other in a standard way. And so a bunch of people got together in a room at some point and decided like which numbers should be mapped to which buttons so that we'd agree on the numbers and then everything can talk to everything else. So for my purposes, I just needed to know the codes for each key on a piano. It's the one-to-one -one mapping. Now, you can use MIDI, obviously, for music, but today a lot of people are experimenting with it for other things, too. So I thought, just as a quick uh, inspiration, um, there's also this Tetris game um, that you play on a MIDI device. And I also learned very recently that some motorized wheelchairs can actually output MIDI, which I, I want to learn more about that. But for now, what I'm going with is the fact that Google introduced MIDI to the web browser in 2015. So you can see it's not super well supported, <laughs> but you know, it's good enough, and if you have Chrome, you can, you can run with this. So here it is in JavaScript. You have an array, and you get this every time somebody presses a button on your keyboard, like this one. And so that's sending a number to my computer through a USB connection. And the number, the, the only one I'm, I'm interested in for me right now is the middle one, which represents which key was pressed. So of course I had to use ports to get this into Elm, and this is my super, super minimal way of doing it. I literally send one integer over to Elm and then handle it from there. So super easy. And this was my very first prototype. Not that exciting, but it works and is very satisfying to see the MIDI note correspond with the right you know, note on the page. Now, to get to this point, I made a lot of different mistakes. Um, I, I come from JavaScript land, so it, it was definitely like bending my brain a little bit to get through the different uh, little changes in syntax that I had to adjust to. And so this is the most common mistake that I've made. This is a mashup of, I guess, JavaScript and Elm. I was putting semicolons everywhere. Another common one I did multiple times, I'm embarrassed to say, was this. Anyone, what, what will this output to the console? Not, not 10. It just outputs one because uh, it turns out you need to put parentheses around things because order of operations. So that was, that was interesting. My takeaway so far about functional programming is you just parentheses all the things <laughs> and then it works. I honestly like 80% of my syntax errors or like unexpected behavior were because I keep forgetting the order in which functions are applied to each other. Then I learned basically just forward function application all the things. And that worked a lot better. <laughs> the other issue was my model um, was a bit problematic. This is a section of it. I ended up making all impossible states uh, possible. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, it's a very common beginner mistake, it turns out. Everything, like, might exist or might be null, right? Because in JavaScript, anything could always be undefined. Like, half of your functions are undefined when you run your, your code. So I figured, okay, I should just be really careful and make use of this maybe thing. And, and you know, like, nothing, there's no guarantees in life, right? So <laughs> I, I thought this made sense. Um, and then I watched a bunch of YouTube videos, including like this one by Richard and a bunch of others with some similar themes. And I basically just copied their code, put it into mine, and changed, changed the names of things. <laughs> and here's a, a, a snippet of how I ended up fixing it, was I have this idea of different kinds of stages in the game. When you're playing the game, you have a game model, and then I move everything into that model that only applies while the game is running. So a lot of those maybes go away, and the thing that I'm most proud about is now my model has only one maybe in the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> the next step was to, thank you. <laughs> the next step was to try out some animation because the prototype I had so far was just this note like appearing and teleporting from one place to another. It felt very mechanical. So I tried out um, Mark Griffith's uh, Elm style animation. Um, sorry, Matthew Griffith, sorry, Matt. Um, <laughs> and we have this um, nice, nice way of transitioning things in and out of the page. So the goal for my application is it'll randomly generate a note, so I need to play this, and if I play the incorrect note, it'll animate what I did instead, um, like accidentally. So it'll highlight and kind of fade in, fade out, which felt a little bit more nice. And then if I got the note correct, it would turn green, and we would get another one and start the process all over again. So this was, this was really nice. I had this, this like sort of declarative syntax. It's a great library, I highly recommend it for UI animations. 
And I just took this and, and ran with it, and it was really good for a while. I'll come back to that in a moment. I figured the next step would be to use graphics. So this is a giant sprite sheet from Super Mario World. And if we zoom in here, there's, there's a lot and a lot and a lot of sprites. I decided to take, I think, four of them, just the basic walking animation. And I, then I realized once I had all these graphics, I don't know how to animate sprites. Uh, I've never made a game before. So I did a little digging, and I found like, techniques that people use on the web for sprite, sprite sheets. And I decided to do this in SVG instead of CSS, because SVG is also new to me. And I figured, well, OK, everything is new. Let's just keep going with this. SVG is really nice because you can take an image like this and then just kind of chunk it into, into parts and then change this view box property represents uh, which section of the image you can see. So we can just rotate through that, and then we have an animation. So here's the first coin animating. It's very satisfying to see that those numbers change in the console. So then I had Mario. <laughs> you can see like half the time, he's not actually like, like nothing happens when you get the right note. <laughs> he just kind of stays there. So there were, there were a bunch of bugs to work out. And the other most confusing one that I still cannot figure out why this happened was half the time Mario scrolls instead of the game scrolling. And I, I don't know why. And at this point, I realized I didn't understand my code anymore, like at all. <laughs> I didn't know how this library worked, and I didn't even know what I wanted anymore to, like, what was the next feature, or what did I even want it to do that it wasn't doing. So I went back to the drawing board, made a bunch of sketches like this that don't really make any sense, actually, but they helped me get unstuck. And I figured I should start from scratch and learn how do I make a thing move on the page using Elm. So I found the on animation frame um, you know, event that I can listen for. And I have it sending a timestamp on every frame. Then all I had to do was figure out, OK, what should happen when I get this event? Right? Well, what goes inside this animation loop? Then I went to the internet and found a bunch of random stuff that did not make any sense from the worlds of game development and um, animation. So in game dev, there's this term called lurping. Um, in animation, there's this thing called tweening and easing. And I don't know what the difference is between any of these. I started to figure that out, but then I realized like, it's probably not that important. But I watched some video tutorials, like this one from Unity, about lerp and what it does and blah, blah, blah. And then I looked it up in the dictionary, and it turns out lerp is a sweet, waxy secretion. <laughs> <laughs> so TIL, today I learned, fun fact for the day. Um, and then Wikipedia said lerp stands for linear interpolation. Doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't actually say that. <laughs> interpolation, linear interpolation. And then I found all these other interesting things in the world of animation, like quaternion slurps. I don't, I don't, I don't even. So the one that was useful for me was this old book written by Robert Penner, who's quite famous in the animation world. And he wrote about animation in action script back in the days of Flash. And he had this technique he called the standard exponential slide, which it turns out is basically linear interpolation and lerping and easing. And all the things are basically the same thing, just done in slightly different ways with different values. Um, the standard exponential slide takes a very simple idea. Basically, it's Zeno's paradox, if you're familiar with that. The idea that if an arrow is moving from one place to another, it'll never reach the destination because, let's say, it goes halfway and then half of that and half of that and so on and so on. So you'll never actually reach the end. But because of JavaScript rounding errors, you will. And it worked. <laughs> so this is the code. Really, really, really simple. Um, and I experimented with this in my from scratch scrolling animation here that does the quote unquote lerp or whatever, the slide. So it's kind of easing in. Or is it easing out? I, I, I can never remember. But it felt, it felt better. So I'm like, OK, I'm on the right track. So I ended up with this, again, the exact same <laughs> output, but the code was my own, and I understood every piece of it. But of course, that wasn't enough, because as you can see, Mario kind of jumps up and down. And he's teleporting um, <laughs> up and down the page, and, and that doesn't quite feel natural. And the scrolling also felt kind of boring to me. And I was thinking, what's missing is Mario usually jumps from like one platform to another. That was like, the most exciting part of the game for me. So I started sketching again. 
And you can see in my notes here, I was playing around with this idea of jumping from like one platform to another, and I was thinking, what should they be? Like buckets and boxes, or just like, I don't know what. And I, don't know if <laughs> I think a couple of people recognize the meme that I'm alluding to here. I do allude to memes a lot in my notes. Um, this one, if I fits, I sits. If we fits, we sits. <laughs> so I was thinking maybe the character could be a cat or something instead, because I'm also like infringing on Nintendo's copyright for the game. So I figured, well, maybe I should change the graphics too. Um, so I, I decided to do some research on like this term, you know, game feel. It's like how do you, what's the, what does it feel like when you play the game? And I fi just figured like, well, let's let's get some examples. So sort of doing some research on like what this might look like in my game if a cat were to jump from one thing to another and like land in a container. So it turns out cats really like containers. And then I just did a bunch of research and like more research. And I really, I really like research when I don't know what to do next. So at some point, I did stop myself with this. And I went back to my original problem. I spent at least two hours looking at cats, by the way. Um, then I figured, OK, let's actually look at the problem here. How do I jump from one place to another when I know the start and I know the end? I just don't know how to make it go in a like realistic motion. Um, I had you know this lurping whatever that at least felt smooth, um, but it only goes in a straight line. And then I experimented with moving the x and y at different rates, so I get a curve. But this is the wrong kind of curve, right? <laughs> when you jump, you don't like go up and then slam sideways into your target. <laughs> You go, you go up and over and then like land down on it. So the piece I was missing, of course, was gravity. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> so I was looking at the animation loop again, and I found some example code online. And now my animation loop looks, this is all of the code. I just add um, some kind of velocity to the x and y, right? This is a vector. And then I change the velocity, the vertical velocity, on every frame using a constant acceleration. And that's it. All of that. So that was just a matter of tweaking the, the actual numbers that went into this. And so then I actually had a realistic jump. <laughs> but it looks realistic, right? And I was just basically all I have to do is change the numbers, and eventually <laughs> I'll, I'll get the right, the sweet spot, and eventually, you know, it'll, it'll work, right? I thought that's what math was, so you just change the numbers. But it turns out uh, this was a simplified version of my problem because, of course, the uh, start and end could be in different places. So I was thinking, okay, like I, I'll just tweak them every single time. And, and wait, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how do I, how do, I do this programmatically? Right? And so I had to go back to math and, and physics. So one morning on a Saturday, I asked my roommate, Daniel, hey, Daniel, do you want to teach me physics? And he said, um... Sure. <laughs> so he did. And we spent like a couple hours whiteboarding stuff and looking things up online. And we ended up with this very basic equation for projectile motion with a constant acceleration. And quick recap of what this was, because I, like, I just learned it. So I wanted to share it with you. Even I don't know, maybe most of you already know this. But it was new to me, because I never took physics in high school. So x represents the destination. This is what you would be solving for to find out, well, given all these conditions, where would it land? And x0 represents the starting position. Um, v, v0 times t is initial vertical velocity times how much time has gone by so far. And then you add the vertical acceleration times the elapsed time squared times 1 half. Don't ask me why there's a 1 half. I don't know how that got in there. I spent a while playing around with it and kind of think I know why. But anyway, algebra. So, if I have the start and the end position, let's say I plug in these numbers, and then I plug in a vertical uh, acceleration of, say, like one and a half pixels per millisecond per millisecond, and a total time of 200 milliseconds to complete the jump, then the only number that I have left to solve for is the initial vertical velocity. So now I've simplified my problem. I've just switched it around. And I thought, OK, how do I, how do I change it so it does this instead of the original equation. Turns out all I have to do is like switch around the variables. It's actually pretty easy. Algebra, it's useful, turns out. So I tried it again. Uh, quick drum roll, please. Do you think it'll work? Hey. <laughs> I, I gave this talk at Elm Europe, and I joked that I flew on a, like, 12-hour or 10-hour flight 
to uh, share how I got a box to land on another box. <laughs> for, so, but this was really, the, these small wins are the most satisfying part, right? This, this was like the key moment of the whole project for me so far. It was like, yes, I understand math and I can make it work for me and get, get things to work the way I want them to do. And, and yeah, so once I had that, I could have something like jumping to any arbitrary set of targets and that was super, super satisfying. Then I got it working with the scrolling motion combined and this was starting to feel like how I wanted it to feel, like something is sort of alive here. Then I went back to the graphics because I gave up on the cat idea. I, I realized I don't know how to draw a cat. I still like the pixel art idea though, so I Googled around for graphics and I found this little guy, kind of like a marshmallow or a cloud. So I went with a cloud idea. Here he is kind of hopping around, just chilling. Super cute, right? <laughs> Turns out there's a lot of free video game graphics that are like public domain that you can use. And then I decided to try drawing my own because I really like pixel art and I thought, okay, I have Photoshop, why don't I try it? Turns out it took me like eight hours to draw a cloud. Um, you'll see why, because I had this idea of he would be sad and then happy and uh, it's really hard to debug pixels. You can see that on the, on the side here, there's like this little extra bit, like it's not lined up correctly. So this is where those several hours went was like, okay, how do I line things up in Photoshop? So that was fun. Now I can show you the actual demo real quick. So here it is. Oh, right, the mouse issue. Ah. You good? Is it? Am I good? Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is what the game looks like. You have, uh, this would be like level zero, basically. You just have three notes to guess. Um, so this one, anyone shout out, what is that first note? G. G, which is this one, I think, if I, I'm on the right octave, yeah. And then that's C. There's kind of a bug where he jumps too high if he play too fast, and he'll actually go infinitely high and never come back down. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. So that was version, thank you, thank you. So that was, that was the very first, like, yeah, I can use this now. Now I know where E and C and G are, like, really well. Um, the next step after this was, because I, yeah, I have a couple minutes left. I'll show you what I'm working on right now, since this is very much a work in progress. I have not added nearly as much to the game in the last two months as I wanted to. You know, life, life stuff happens. It turns out you, don't, you can't always spend every day, all day on the weekends and evenings uh, working on your side project. So this is where I am right now. Um, I wanted to be able to play and visualize every single note on an 88 key piano. And so far I can only visualize like about 10, right? So I figured, all right, all I have to do is like draw, you know, the treble clef, the bass clef, and then like maybe a couple lines above and below. Um, it turns out it doesn't actually look like this. It looks more like this, where you have a lot more lines above and below. It turns out this is how many octaves there are on a piano. It's a lot of lines. So what I did was I just copied, or I counted and then copied the number of lines on this and then put it into my game. And then it ended up taking like the whole screen and was a little, little bit unwieldy. Um, but it, it works and I can show you really briefly what that looks like. Um, let's see, I'm gonna do this little mouse thing again. I'm trying to get to the other tab. So you guys can tell me up left. Left more. Down left, almost there. Down left? Up. Oh, thank you. Yes. There it is. All right. Oh, I can't see the notes very well. Hold on. So you can kind of see, oh, right. So the first note is like really, really high up. And I can go like maybe, I can shift the octave here. There we go, thank you. <laughs> so it's a little unwieldy. Um, I figured I should do what real musicians do and actually get that notation. This is what it will actually look like in music. Um, you have a lot of different shortcuts like this. So you'll write in this little, I forget the, the Italian word or Latin word that it stands for, but you write 8VA or 8VB to show if it's one octave up or down from where that note on the left is actually drawn. And if it's a really high note or a really low note, you would write 15 MA or MB. 
um, to show that that's two octaves up or down. And so <laughs> that's where I left off. I haven't even finished this part. It, it should be like very, very doable. I think like one more evening and I should have it done. But the hard part for me moving forward this, with this project is I don't know which features to add. And, and, and like that's the hardest part, right? Not the coding, but the designing and, and knowing like, well, what would be useful for the, for the user? Or in this case, me. And since I'm not really a musician and I've never taught music to anyone, what I really need next is, is a music teacher or musician to talk to and get their advice. Oh yeah, hi. <laughs> okay, we should talk after. <laughs> So yeah, if you or you know anybody, please reach out to me. Um, I'm also open to any suggestions about the code. This is me on GitHub. The project right now is called C Play, because it's like you see it and then you play it. And I'm open to pull requests, suggestions. My code's kind of still a mess, but the latest working version is on there. And to be continued, reach out to me online, Twitter, and all that. Thank you all so much.